Hello, I'm Taj, digitally known as Tropic Vibes, the host of Nifty Business, where we highlight NFTs and explore Web 3.0 as we move from pure speculation to creating real world value. So years ago, the son of one of my father's friends came to him asking him to change a check on his behalf and give him the cash. Now, of course, this is someone he has dealt with for years, very familiar with. However, his son was not necessarily someone he was really familiar with. So he had asked to talk to his father. So when he gets on the phone, he speaks to the father. The father authorizes it, says that, okay, you know, he's sick. And because of his condition, he's not physically able to do it. And that's why he sent his son. No problem. My father ends up changing the check. However, about a week later, he found out that he did not speak to the friend at all and his son had just committed fraud. He had a partner that was on the other line that was able to perfectly imitate the father and sounded just like him, spoke like him, and even answered some questions that he would know because they all were in the same circle. So what ended up happening, of course, was that my father was out of a lot of money and now he has to deal with one of his friend's sons being a scammer. This was years ago before there was all this deep fake technology and all these different things with voice changers and AI and all this stuff. It is even worse now. So it's very interesting that this week we had a conversation with the crypto tech women and we're talking about all these security risks and so forth. So that's what we're going to dive into today. Some of the topics that we hit during that. And of course, this AI deep fake voicing over the phone is something that came up. So we're going to hit three major topics, some risks that are in the area, ways to protect yourself using certain tools, and of course, some best practices. So as far as what I said with my father being scammed over the phone, that sort of thing is on the rise right now. Because as you can see, there's so many songs and artists that are coming out by people that were not at the recording session. They used AI to mimic their voice. There's a lot of information of us online and all sorts of things. So questions could be answered using this stuff to sift through different data. And it is really just crazy times that we're living in. So as far as what's happening within NFT and Web3 circles right now, our people are getting scammed scanned by deep fakes. There was even a situation brought up by someone that was faking to be their son that was saying that they needed money wired to them because they were arrested and so forth. So all these different things are happening right now, but different ways to protect yourself. How are you going to hedge against all this AI stuff? Well, first of all, when we know that we've been online for 20 years or so, we're putting all this information out in tweets and in Instagram posts and so forth, is that when you're setting up security questions online, just don't use the real stuff. Anything that you tweet about, don't select that like everyone knows what your favorite movie is what your favorite song is your favorite artist because you tweet about that stuff you write about it you have blogs and youtube videos and all sorts of stuff so do not use that as a security question first and foremost and even if you have to select something that is very common because sometimes they have a limited number of things make it up just know that you lie on that for every time there's a security feature you put the fake answer in there so with that said different ways to protect yourself number one Even if you hear someone on the phone and, you know, it might be a member of the team, it could be an NFT project or someone even such as myself. Okay, I'm a podcaster. If you think that you hear my voice or whatever and we're supposed to be best friends, well, guess what? It could be a deep fake. And what you need to do is ask that person a question that only they would know, like something that happened during their last meeting or maybe you have a family secret password or whatever it might be. Like, okay, well, we had lunch last week. What did we have? Well, only that person would know that okay so things like that would be very hard to deep fake that especially if that person is not posting every meal that they have online well the same happens within crypto and nfts and uh, all this stuff uh, there's definitely scammers, there's hackers, there's all sorts of things. Now, most of the time, it really isn't a hacker. It is someone who is tricking someone using social engineering. They're spoofing different links. They're doing all sorts of things to get you to FOMO into things. So those are the things that have been going on really since the bull market. So that is nothing new. But something that they're doing and they're getting very good at is masking links so that way Twitter thinks that it is an official website. So for example, when we're in this space, WalletGuard was the one that was hosting this with CTW. And they shared a link that made it look like that was leading to OpenSea. However, it took you to the WalletGuard homepage. So the way they actually posted that link, the preview that pops up, it says OpenSea. So people will click that, they'll go to the website, and then not really realize they don't check in the browser. And guess what? They were actually at the WalletGuard site. Now, this was not malicious, but just imagine if this is someone trying to do some wrong thing, saying that this was a mint for Basie or whatever it might be. A lot of people are trying to get into that, the next Yuga Mint or 
or the next Azuki Mint or whatever it might be. And well, guess what? It's a fake link. So be careful of that. Not only do you want to look at that when you're clicking it, but also look in the browser and you know make sure that the link actually is what it says it is because that preview might be forwarding it. It could be a misspelled thing. Make sure it is the official link. And I know people love to say, do not click links, do not click links, but it is very hard. I mean, in what world can you possibly go without clicking any links at all? Now, Yes, there are different precautions that you're going to take. You're going to use separate devices than your crypto devices. You're not going to be uh, logged into, you know, your MetaMask and then clicking in the same browser, some random links. No, like things like that you're not going to do. But let's just say, you know, the whole analogy of even if my mother is sending a link, I'm not going to click it. Well, you know, that's all fine and dandy. It sounds great in theory. But let's say you're making funeral arrangements or something. You're on the road and that your mother is sending you this thing. It's like, hey, you need to approve this because grandma needs to go into the ground. You, you know, what are you going to do? No, mom, I'm not going to click it because I am in Web3 and I can't take that risk. So uh, grandma is just going to have to sit there until I uh, get to a safe spot and I can get to uh, <laughs> one of those safe devices. Well, that's really not going to happen. So anyways, so that is just an example that I'm giving. But just when if you do have to click a link, just make sure that for one, you're using a device that's not tied to all of your assets, that you are also not necessarily in a situation where you are rushing because that's how mistakes are made. That's how you don't realize that you're on the wrong website and so forth. So don't FOMO into things. Don't rush into things. Make sure that if you're clicking on something that you're actually looking at the browser tab to make sure it is what it is because a lot of the times, this is something that's old. It's been going on for like 10 years. They'll use a subdomain and it's not necessarily the official website. So for example, instead of it being at google.com, they might do some uh, google.com.scammer.com. So, you know, if you just first look and see, okay, google.com, but then you don't pay attention to the fact that it says, no, the actual website is scammer.com and the google.com is all that stuff beforehand, just like how you have the www. So just be aware of that stuff. Be very cognizant of it. Know the websites. Try to bookmark them if you you know need to. Just don't have all of your assets exposed and opened up when you're actually having to click a link and so forth. But also, there's different things that can also be done by using certain tools because, of course, yeah, you're, you're going to take all those different steps. But the number one thing that everyone should have, whether you're in crypto, whether you're in Web3 or not, is two-factor authentication. That's what 2FA is. If you go into Twitter, you can go into Google, you can go into Yahoo!, any of these applications or any of these things are going to have an option for 2FA. That's what it will say, two-factor authentication. Now, the, usually they give you two options. Either they're going to send you a text message to confirm whatever it is that you're doing, or you use an authentication app. Now, do not use the text message. That is something that I did not even know that this was so prevalent. Luckily, for the most part, Everything that I log into allows you to use a two-factor authentication app such as Google, Microsoft, Authy, and all those other ones. However, there's something that I learned during this space that with Google two-factor authentication, there is an option to have it cloud backed up, and that is a massive no-no. Do not do that. If you have it backed up in the cloud, it's automatically syncing. They're trying to, of course, go everything cloud-wise and ever, and it exposes everything. So just turn that off if you're using Google Authentication or just use a different app altogether. But then they also have the physical keys of different ones that you can actually get a physical authenticator, and you can click that button on a physical device, and you can even actually use your ledger, I found out, as an authentication device. So you can use your ledger to then authorize you to go into your Gmail and so forth. So it's pretty cool in that sense. However, just know that if you're using something like Google, do not have it cloud backed up. So go into your settings, go check that out. And while you're looking at settings, look in your Twitter, look in all your Googles and your Yahoos and all of those things to see what you're actually connected to. Because a lot of times you can connect up to whatever site it is, whatever program it is, whatever application you can sign up using one of your existing social media accounts. However, a lot of the times, or I should say almost every time, people don't read exactly what they're signing into, what they are authorizing it to do. Is this just checking your, let's say, posts? Or let's say, are you just 
using that to sync your contacts. But sometimes some of these malicious apps might have you authorize all sorts of things and permissions that people don't even realize are happening. But just go check that out. Anything that you're not familiar with or you're no longer using, just disconnect it. So a lot of the times you might just need it for like a one-time thing, sign in for something, use it, then disconnect it after that. But if you go and look there, you might see some applications and things that you don't even know what they are because you signed up with this thing in 2008 or whatever it might be. That app or company might not even be in business anymore and you used it as a Facebook login or a Google login or whatever, a Apple login, and you don't even realize that it's still connected to this thing. So just imagine if some bad actor ends up taking over that app and using that data for all sorts of craziness. So, well, you don't want to do that. Just disconnect everything and just don't even bother with that. And speaking of disconnect, just really quick, a lot of people will say that disconnect your MetaMask and your wallets from various apps. Well, that's not revoking the permissions because if you've already signed off permissions, the only way to revoke those permissions is actually go to something like revoke.cash and revoke those permissions. It's going to take a little bit of gas and whatever it might be, depending what it is. But hey, it's a lot better than losing your assets. So just so you know, if you disconnect your MetaMask from a particular app or website, but you've already given permission, that is not necessarily, it means your things are safe once you disconnect it. So just putting that out there really quick. This is something that really happened and we um, really discussed on the podcast way back when, when everyone thought that it was a massive open sea uh, scam was going on and so forth. But uh, we quickly learned that just disconnecting from open sea, and it wasn't actually an open sea scam, but that was a huge wallet problem. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole because that's old news at this point. But long story short, all those people that were having spaces and were telling people just disconnect your wallet and so forth, well, that was wrong information. You have to go to revoke.cash or uh, revoke it in another way. But once that permission is granted, disconnecting is not going to do anything. So it's sort of like you give someone your power of attorney. Well, just because you've signed off all your rights into that to give someone the, the power of attorney to make a decision for you, just because you hang up the phone doesn't mean they still have that power. So what you actually have to do is have that document null and voided. And that's basically what revoke that cash does. It's taking away that permission. So just because you hang up the phone doesn't mean that that person doesn't have the permission to do whatever it is. And that's basically what you're doing with revoke that cash, putting it into layman's terms. But going back to this, tools and different ways to protect yourself. So do not use SMS because people can swap out SIM cards. People could do all sorts of things. And there is a lot of things going around right now. They're trying to figure out if uh, these are people that are working at the cell phone companies that are, you know, maybe a minimum wage desk worker that's just working in one of the AT&T Sprint stores or wh whichever company it might be. And they're selling information to people to get these different SIM cards and be able to do the two-factor authentication for people. And supposedly, this is actually what happened to Ben. So Ben, as in BitBoy Crypto, there was a huge thing with his account. And supposedly, what happened was he believes that he has footage and proof that it was somebody within a cell phone company had some sort of ties to leaking that stuff out. And they were able to get in there through two-factor authentications through a cell phone using his SIM card. Now, I don't know if that's proven, if that's fact, but that is the theory right now because it happens. And I know people that have actually had their SIM card stolen. For example, I know Travis Wright from The Nifty Show. Uh, he is someone who has this whole crazy story about how someone actually stole his SIM card and was messing around with stuff. And of course, uh, luckily he caught it and was able to actually narrow it down and figure out who the person was. But uh, anyways, uh, long story short, what I'm trying to say is people can steal your SIM card. So your best bet is to use another form of two-factor authentication, one that is not backed up in the cloud, and preferably, if you can go that route, get a hardware device. And lastly, as far as tools go also, a password manager. Now, password123, is probably still the most common used password. Absolutely terrible idea. So definitely get something like one password or something like Bitwarden, which is open source, and I have that set up. And I know when these things came out, I was like so hesitant. I'm like, why would I put all my passwords into a password manager? And then someone just hacks into that and then they have everything. So I had this crazy system that's in my head, how I can log into all these different things, have all these different passwords, but even myself with my crazy system, some 
sometimes I forget those passwords or had to use some sort of alteration or a variation of that password because a particular site had some other requirements or maybe the original way or my system was too long for that particular one. So there's all sorts of different reasons why uh, that doesn't necessarily work and I forget my password sometimes. So something like this is great. You get yourself a password manager, you make a complicated master password and then you have it in there. Don't have anything backed up on the cloud. Don't have this stuff stored anywhere. And uh, your best bet is to go with one of these reputable ones. And as I said, Bitwarden is an open source one. A lot of people have been prodding and looking at that code, sort of like Trezor, right? Trezor, you have your hardware wallet. People have been looking at that open source code for the longest time. So some of these closed systems, those proprietary systems, such as the Ledger, and not picking on Ledger, of course, you know, I'm a fan of Ledger or whatever. But as you can see by listening to the podcast over the years and so forth, I say years as if it's not just two years. But anywho, uh, that I've always favored the Trezor because it's open source. Open source means that the whole community can look at this and they're able to report things and patch up things and whatever it is. When something is closed, you have no idea what's happening under the hood. So if somebody figures that out, God help us. Or worst case scenario, there is a backdoor for these companies to go rogue or for the government to come in or some whatever, some crazy stuff could happen, a rogue employee, who knows. But I don't want to go down that route itself. There's enough to worry about these days. So as far as making these transactions now, let me go back to the whole wallet. I, I know uh, I'm sort of over the place, but just a lot of things we covered in this space. When you are getting ready to make these transactions and you're signing and all sorts of things, I said, do not do this in a rush, right? Make sure you're calm, cool, and collected. You're not FOMOing into anything. You're not drunk. You're not tired. You're not at work. You're rushing out the door, driving your car, anything of that nature. You want to be able to stop, pause, look and see what's going on, sign those transactions. Hopefully, you're not having your most expensive assets, whether it be crypto or your NFTs, in some hot wallet that you're uh, doing transactions for when you're driving down the road between stoplights and you don't have the focus. No, don't do that, right? So make sure you're able to stop, read everything. But even so, even if you're stopping and reading things, sometimes there's so many things that comes up, you have to sign for it depending how complex that contract is. And that stuff is just mumbo jumbo. It doesn't make any sense. So something like WalletGuard, who was also the co-host of the space, is great. They translate what's happening in that wallet, that transaction, letting you know in English exactly what's happening. You're about to give away everything. You're about to give away permission. You're about to send this token to that wallet. You're getting ready to send this NFT and all of your whatever. You know, it says all of that in plain English and they've recently upgraded and added some AI tools. So basically just think of the power of ChatGPT with a wallet protector that's explaining things to you in real time that you can communicate going back and forth. Pretty cool stuff. But as if that's not enough for you, just the last thing I will say is just a system that should really be implemented for everyone. Have multiple wallets. Don't put everything in one place. We're assuming that we're at the point where your crypto is not sitting on the centralized exchange because those can go down at any time. So I'm going to assume that if you're listening to this, you actually have your crypto in either a hot wallet or a cold wallet, preferably a cold wallet. But hopefully all of your crypto and all of your NFTs are not in the same wallet that you're minting from, that you're interacting with in an open seat, you're signing to go into websites and so forth. So at minimum, you should have three wallets. You have a holding wallet. That stuff is like your vault. You're like not moving that stuff at all. Then you have one that you're connecting up to, say, OpenSeas, you're doing transactions with and you're shifting things around and so forth. You're doing that. And then you have your crazy DGen wallet. So at minimum, you have three. So any kind of sketchy website that you have no idea what's going on with this company and so forth, that's the one you're going to use to connect. You're not going to use your vault to connect to Mint to some... I don't know, free mint project that you never even heard of. No, do not do that. So you have your vault. Do not connect that up. Have your OpenSea wallet. Have your DGen wallet. Do all the crazy things, all your transactions and DeFi, all that stuff, your crazy mints that like, you know, could go to zero. Just do it in something that is not holding all of your assets. So 
With that said, at bare minimum, of course, if you want to go really far and say, okay, these are the ones I'm going to have with this, and I'm not going to have more than X amount of value in each wallet, and I'm going to spread them across 10, like if that's how your assets are set up, like you have millions and millions and maybe even billions, if you're listening to this, awesome, cool, good for you. So spread them out, do not have them all in one place, but that you know should be common sense for anyone that has billions, but you just never know. Right. I've seen some NFL players, whatever, that are supposed posting screenshots of Bank of America accounts with like 50 million dollars in it. Like who has 50 million dollars sitting in cash in their regular bank account, knowing that it is not federally insured? It is losing money with interest and all sorts of things. But yeah, they're yeah, they're football players. They're making 10, 15, 20, 30 million dollars a year. But they don't necessarily know that that is just crazy. First of all, you shouldn't be flexing that on the internet anyways, but letting everybody know that you have all of it in one place, not the smartest thing in the world. Not only is it at a risk from a, a, a failure, a financial standpoint, just like what we saw with FTX, right? The bank could go down just because it's Bank of America doesn't mean it's never going to go down. Anything can happen. But then also, it's just a security risk. You're letting everyone know what you have, where you have it, and that it's all in one place, not the brightest move. So let's use some common sense. Let's use these tools to protect ourselves and let's just take that next step. But, you know, nobody is above it. I've heard people that have been in the space for literally 10 years doing all this crypto stuff and even they have been scammed. Right. So like things do happen. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not an expert. No one's an expert. We all do different things. And the important thing is that we learn from it. We share it with others because there are people that were in the space for so long that they were able to come up and say, you know, this is what happened to me. Then on the other side, you had some people that were like, yeah, I've been in the space for 10 years and I've never been scammed. So um, just because it has never happened to me or to you, that doesn't mean that we are invincible. The higher the amount of transactions that you do, the more likely you are to fall susceptible to this stuff. So as we know, I'm not the biggest degen. I'm not flipping in the things and just minting and, and doing all this crazy stuff. Like, you know, so I don't do the volume that some of these guys do hundreds, thousands, if not of transactions in a week. Right. So the more transactions that you do, the more you open yourself up to risk. So as far as all of this goes, I hope it's not too much all over the place. But just for the most part, just know that there's some crazy things happening. There are risks. People are doing all sorts of things. The good guys are getting good, but the bad guys are getting better, too, as well. So use those tools to factor authentication. Use things like wallet guards to know what you're actually doing before you sign a transaction. You have your passwords for all these different things using a password manager or at the very least a very complex system that you can remember and not using the same password everywhere. And lastly, do you not have everything in one wallet, one place? It's just not smart, right? You wouldn't do that with your physical cash, have it all under the bed and then a fire happens. So do not do that. Have all your NFTs and crypto and everything in one place that you just happen to be degenning into a free mint. That's just not sound decision making. So hopefully you found that interesting and I didn't scare you too much, but you know, just trying to condense that space down, we could have literally went for hours. WalletGuard had a space after that and they just poured out more information, but keep yourself safe, educate, educate, educate. And if you found this information helpful, please feel free to leave a review on whatever podcasting app that you are listening to. As usual, I want to thank you for taking time to listen to this as we're learning and building Web3 together. So until next time, later. The Nifty Business Show is not investment advice. It provides insights and information within the space. As with anything, please do your own research before making a decision whether you're making an investment or a purchase.